Well, I welcome you to the men's retreat for this year. It is wonderful to see you all. There were some who intended to be here, and uh, circumstances arose that made it impossible for them to come. And uh, remember them in the retreat as well. But I understand there might be one or two who will be joining us for some time, sometime tomorrow and Friday. It's always special to have a retreat for men, not that it isn't special to have a retreat for the ladies, it is, but there's something about a need for true virile spirituality in the world today that makes a retreat for men especially important. Because after all, there is a certain psychology that comes with manhood, a psychology that you find in our Lord himself, his humanity gave him that, and we have to think as he does. We have to bring our minds, that is our intellects, we have to bring our, our hearts, that is our wills, into tune with his, perfectly into union, unison with his. And uh, retreat is a very important way to do that. Now, this uh, initial conference is a, a generally a practical matter of trying to handle in advance questions that might arise. So uh, we're going to get down to a certain brass tacks here and then return to the point that I just made here. Uh, first of all, does everyone have a copy of the schedule? Okay, there is a, I will have a copy here, and there is a copy posted also in the pavilion that you can look at you need to. And also, you all have the booklets, the retreat booklets. Okay, that's good. Those are yours to keep, so it'd be good if you put your name on them, actually, if you would sign them uh, so that the notes that are contained therein are yours, and, uh, you know, one knows that if that book strays, it belongs to you, or if they see it lying in the pew, that it is yours, and it will always come back to you, and please take them home with you with the notes you've made. You'll notice uh, that we've allowed space in the booklets for note-taking, so you can use the booklets to take whatever notes you need. You don't need, actually, to have extra paper with you unless you want that. Now, um, we also have books in the back that you're free to use, and we have some books here on the side that uh, you're free to use and buy, if you'd like to. Uh, there's a box here. I haven't really marked prices on the books there. Uh, I had said in some previous retreat, retreat, I believe that these small books were, I don't know what I said, $5, and the medium-sized books, $7, and the large books, $10. Then I found out the church was actually losing money on them. So I, I think it's more along the lines of somewhere between 10 and 20. I honestly didn't check the prices. Um, but, uh, you know, if you make a reasonable offering according to, your, according to your means, you're welcome to drop that in here. And, uh, and so it's kind of the honor system. I, I want the books read. St. Francis de Sales wants the books read. Right? St. Alphonsus de Liguori wants the books read. Our Lord wants the books read. So uh, I want to uh, be sure that you have them. I see some of them are actually missing. Um, I think the last of the copies of some of them have been taken, so I'll, I'll bring more, replenish the supply when I uh, return for the closing conferences. Now, as you see from your schedule, uh, I will have the conferences, uh, well, this conference tonight, obviously, and the, the four conferences tomorrow. Father Greenwell will have a conference then tomorrow night. He's driving back from Cleveland, where he's the funeral for Mr. Donald Wolf. But he assured me and I'm sure he will be back for a conference uh, at about 7.45 p.m. tomorrow. And then he will give you the next uh, conferences for Friday morning into afternoon. And I'll be back then Friday evening for the closing conference of Friday and for the closing conference of the retreat on Saturday. Now, uh, with regard to silence, this, this actually marks the beginning of the silence, and it's the silencium magnum, the grand silence. 
which really should not be broken except for some serious need. But there are other ways we can communicate what we need. If you need something, let me know, please. Or, uh, well, if you just tell me, I'll, I'll, I'll find a way to get that. If you see one of the boys here, they're here to help too. So if you need soap or anything like that, let me know. and We'll round it up for you. If there's a light bulb burned out, if something is uh, um, amiss or lacking to you, please let me know. Now, we had a lot of rain. We've had a lot of rain, so we have a, plenty of, a copious supply of umbrellas here. And in the pavilion, I have a receptacle for them. It looks like a big old hamper, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, but when you take the umbrellas there, you can drop the umbrellas in the hamper, and then it, they're all the same, so it doesn't matter. You don't have to take the same one or claim the same one. They're pretty much uniform. So just take whatever's there and use it when you leave. We've had a lot of rain. I don't know that we'll uh, have a plague with the rain um, that the ladies had during their retreats, but we'll take and be grateful for what God sends. In any case, we're prepared with the umbrellas. So uh, I would recommend this, though, that even if it's a clear night, it would be a good idea to take one of the umbrellas back to the cabins with you because you don't know what you're going to wake up to in the morning. And if it's, uh, if it's pouring rain, the, the umbrella would be a very good tool to have on hand back at the cabins with you. Uh, again, with regard to the, to the silence, though, it's important to be considerate of your neighbor here and not to distract another person. Uh, they have not come for whatever. I, I talked to the children about this. If they... Yeah, tell them, don't distract each other, certainly in prayer. I mean, it's insulting to our Lord that somebody wants to put on his own show and get somebody else's attention, rather than allow those who come to give their hearts and their minds to God, which is the essence of prayer. So we don't want to take that away from God. So please be careful not to be considerate of your neighbor and not being a distraction to another. Um... With regard to the conferences themselves, uh, please do not interrupt my conferences because they're long enough. In fact, that's an understatement. Please do not interrupt Father Greenwell's conferences because his reasoning is very tight and you don't want to interject things that would send them off. So either, either way, please, uh, if there are questions that arise, and I expect there will be, uh, please go ahead and fill out one of the cards here. We have these index cards for you to use. And, uh, you know, you could actually keep them with you, keep one or two on hand with you as you're sitting there and jot down some questions. And again, you can put them in the box here. And uh, also, I mean, for that matter, uh, even a note saying you want to meet you want to meet with me, uh, you can put, or my father Greenwell, you can put that in the box too and we'll take a look, we'll communicate that way. Um, but especially questions that you have that you'd like answered, we'll pretty much save them till the end of the retreat and then take a look at those questions. Uh, the important thing, not to interrupt the conferences though. Now, uh, many of you have been here before, so you know your way around. If you see someone who hasn't been here before, I'm wandering off to the North 40, please uh, don't let them, you know, wander down, I, down, down Route 32 or anything like that. So, um, but most of you know your way around here pretty well, I think. So uh, We have almost 60 acres here, by the grace of God. And when I say by the grace of God, I mean that uh, in a way that perhaps you wouldn't know. We, Father Greenwell and I, have been looking for property for the camp for the longest time. The camp has been going on for uh, over 30 years. Started at seminary in Ridgefield, Connecticut, back in 1981, I believe, 1980-81, and um, and was kind of wandering and renting campgrounds, and uh, and uh, so we, we began looking for a ground used for the children's camp, and uh, finally, uh, we actually did buy some pro uh, acreage about an hour east of here, so an extra hour away from Immaculate Conception, 
but it, it was um, basically the side of a cliff. Much of it was uh, precipitous. So, uh, um, as it turns out, that was sold and uh, nothing was lost, really. But uh, we were looking at about 40 acres nearby here, but it was mud, one enormous field of mud with every rain. And we had high tension power lines crossing the property from one corner to the opposite corner. So not the ideal situation, but again, we were looking for what we could afford. But we went through uh, contract after contract after contract that was shot down by one thing or another for well over a year, and we could never quite close that deal. And uh, we began to suspect there was something going on, and there was, because after all that, and we were no closer to closing that deal, especially because of the waste disposal, uh, waste uh, water and so on. Uh, suddenly the real estate agent said, well, my uncle just died, he left this property, so this is on the market, would you like to take a look at it? And this was the property, after all that. So I can't help but think that we had the same, something similar to what happened to us in the Cincinnati itself, that we had property and it just, nothing moved forward, we were blocked, because God had something much better in mind. So I, I, when I say, by the grace of God, I really mean that in its fullest sense. Thank God for this blessing. Now, um, we, we ordinarily ask a brother bell to ring the bell five minutes before the events listed in the schedule. But uh, perhaps I can ask one of the lads to do it, who are here to help, because they're here to help. And uh, that will help to teach them responsibility, I trust. Although uh, there are things they're not going to have to be involved in. So, uh, well, let me just ask you, is there anyone over there, one of the cabins, who would be willing to do that, just to ring the bell five minutes? There is a bell, you've seen it, you've heard it, most of you, right? hanging here over by the, uh, the electrical panels. Uh, it's like a little mission bell, rings with a rope. Is there anyone who'd be willing to do that? Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll check with our, with our noble youngsters and see uh, if they would be uh, bell ringers here. So. They won't die oh, okay, Jim, thank you. And um, we'll see how well it goes with them. Okay. Now, confessions are, are mentioned here, and uh, they are mentioned as taking place during the rosary, during the day. For example, on Thursday, you see uh, the rosary at 11.30 in the morning, and uh, we'll play, pray all 15 decades of the rosary each day. Joyful mysteries in the morning and sorrowful mysteries in the afternoon. And then glorious mysteries in the evening with benediction. And uh, we'll hear confessions then at 11.30 during the joyful mysteries. I'll ask one of you to lead those joyful mysteries uh, while I hear confessions. And then uh, again, on Friday, we have the, actually the schedule is a little different there at 12.15. Uh, rosary, Joyful Mysteries uh, would be at 12.15, as I say, but that doesn't give uh, too much time there, does it? 12.15 to 12.30, hmm. Um, I'll have to adjust that somehow. So, in any case, um, but we'll make that work. I, I don't think you have tr any trouble uh, having confessions there. I do write, say this though, the confessional is not as soundproof as I would like, so it really has to, has, has to whisper in the confessional. We'll turn the fan on in front of the one confessional to block it, so we'll only use one side of the confessional. That's something I'm determined to fix this year, in the course of this coming year, to fix that confessional and make it more user-friendly. So, um, you know, that's one reason why I like to hear the confessions during the rosary, because then you, know, you have a certain uh, anonymity. Uh, well, I, I should say it's, it makes it more difficult to hear anything that should not be heard. So, 
In any case, the confessions will be heard. And if anyone wants a confession outside of the times, you can always, they'll always set that up individually if you want to, so just say so. Now, um, on Thursday night, we have the holy hour, but as far as exposition, I don't think we can have all night adoration. Uh, it really wears the men out, wears the ladies out too. And I, I think it's very important that people be well rested to get the maximum out of the out of the retreat. So I, we, we will not plan on all night adoration. If we had thirty men here, we could arrange that. It wouldn't be overly difficult. But if we have fewer than twenty, it does make it difficult. So, but we will have the the Thursday night holy hour here before the blessed sacrament, and. Uh, then we have, uh, again, private conferences, if you want, please let me know, or just pass me a note over during the meals, and we'll make arrangements. Same with Father Greenwell. At the end of the retreat, I'll give you a little form which asks your opinion of how things went. <clears throat> Most of you know the drill. You don't have to return them if you have, if you have nothing to say. Uh, you don't have to sign them if you do have something to say. But it just gives us something to go by. So I appreciate any... Um, it's nice, it's always nice to have some good things said, but sometimes it's even more important to have uh, some constructive criticism that we can fix, so uh, both are welcome, believe me. Um, in case of rain, or the umbrellas, and in case of injury, please let us know if there's anything that happens, if there are medications or something that need, there's a critical care or an urgent care place just down in Mount Orab, three miles away. So, no matter what happens, I think we're pretty well covered here. And uh, if something malfunctions, let me know. Father Greenwell told me that in one of the cabins, the shower uh, heat, hot and cold, are reversed. So, if you're not getting hot water one way, turn the other way. Okay. <laughs> One way you should be getting hot water in those showers. But you know, something else he told me, uh, there's a kind of quirky there, is that uh, you have to have a certain amount of water flowing to turn on one of those heaters. And so uh, he said, he just found this out evidently and passed it on to me, that sometimes you need to turn the water on in a sink and also in the shower at the same time to get the thing to move quickly. Uh, to get the, the, what do you call it, tankless water heater uh, firing away. They work very well, and they work. You just got to get the water flow going through them. And uh, frankly, I, I'm uh, talking to Father Greenwell about replacing the old ones with the, the new state-of-the-art models because they, they work very, very well. Uh, in the meantime, uh, do realize they do work, and they will give you hot water. You might have to just coax them a little bit. Some of them, in one cabin in particular. Uh, of course, it's an emergency. Let us know right away. Any necessity, please bring that to our attention. Now, um, okay, it's almost 8:30 already, and we have benediction with the rosary at eight, at nine o'clock. So, I mentioned to begin with how important it is for men, especially, to make this retreat. How important I see it is anyway, for men to make a retreat annually. And uh, that is because manhood is, is under attack. And manhood is under attack today because there is a, 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 an assault from hell against the fatherhood of God, against God the Father. All that we believe as Catholics is based on the revelation of the Blessed Trinity of Persons in God. And that Blessed Trinity of Persons in God begins, originates in the Father. God is indeed Father. There are those who would happily cut your head off for saying such a thing. 
today. But there are many Catholics who have willingly, even joyfully given their lives and given their heads for that truth. As John the Baptist gave his life and his head for the truth of the sanctity of the marriage vows, so so many other Catholics, so many Catholics have given their lives. And their last words were an expression of their faith in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, who have been revealed to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. Fatherhood is under attack. And as I mentioned in the Father's Day sermon, that every man, even if he is not graced with having biologically given life in the world, has a father's heart. Every man has the heart of a father, and the father's heart is protective. A father's heart wants to mentor, wants to protect. And uh, every man has that, has that in him. That is precisely why hell, the powers of hell, want to destroy the Father in that capacity as the mentor and guide and as the protector and guardian. Because the powers of hell want to get past that, and they have to get past that guard, they have to get past that protector to get at the innocent and the defenseless. They want to take that, they want to take that out of their way. They're doing a very good job of doing a very bad job of removing that. And so men today have to rise to the occasion. Those who understand what is going on, as you do, that's why you're here, have to rise to the occasion and confront that by being the best that you can possibly be. As far as your vocations, as far as your manhood lived and lived as a Catholic man, a Catholic gentleman. That is the highest compliment you can pay to anyone, to say that he's a Catholic gentleman. And that is precisely what we need each, and each of us to be, absolutely. May I help you? Oh, they are? Okay. Why don't you prop them open and just go in and out of those doors there? Thanks. You're here for benediction, right? Yes, sir. Uh, punctual. Thank you. So, the, the men have to step up. You see, this, this entire assault we're dealing with now has to do with an ancient error which we're going to talk about. And that ancient error is called Gnosticism. And it is a direct confrontation with the sovereignty of God the Father and an effort to degrade him and actually to abolish him in the minds and hearts of the faithful to turn the entirety of mankind away from him. Gnosticism wants to exalt the feminine. And all of the various forms of Gnosticism all involve this exaltation of the feminine, the divine feminine. From witchcraft to it, Lester Crowley's Book of the Law and Telema, all of the occult movements want to denigrate masculinity, virility, manliness, and to exalt the feminine. This is a subversion. Unfortunately, Many men have bought into this. And the whole purpose of this, as I say, is to destroy masculinity. But as a consequence of it, 
It is also destroying femininity. It is destroying both. And it is up to us to prevent that from happening. Insofar as we can, by the grace of God. And that is, again, why you're here. Because of that grace of God, which is absolutely essential to mount that defense, we honor our soldiers. Time and time again in the airports, I will hear people say, thank you for your service, thank you for your service to our men and now women in uniform. But each one of us here has to be a soldier fighting on a different front. I wondered about our, our, Catholic, our Catholic military men and women realizing that they're fighting, as they're told, for our rights and our liberties and our freedoms here. And we appreciate that. But do they, what do they make of it when they think, well, I'm fighting for the right to abort children? While I am, while I am confronting an enemy here abroad, my own government and my own people are aborting their children by the hundreds of thousands every year. And there is the real war. There's a real war going on. It's a kind of civil war going on in their own countries back home. Are they fighting? Are they serving to protect that? God forbid. I say this by way of illustration that we have to give them something to fight for, something right, something good. When a country and its people become so corrupt that their system of laws their morals are so degraded, then there's really nothing to fight for that is worth, but is worth fighting for, I should say. We here have to give them something to fight for, something worth fighting for. We have to fight for our country here domestically. And we do that, well, not so far did we do that with weaponry, with earthly weaponry. We realize that this is a battle against principalities and powers, the powers of darkness in high places. That's the battle that we're fighting here domestically. And we have to be willing to fight that. Are we doing it? Each one of you, in one way or another, is doing that. And you pray the rosary truly pray the rosary, you are doing that. When you attend Mass and truly adore our Lord present there in the Blessed Sacrament, yes, you are, you are actually fighting that war, even there. When you uh, stand up for the cause of defending innocent life, you are, in fact, fighting that battle. Are you fighting it most effectively and most with the greatest dedication that you have? Well, that's another question, isn't it? Perhaps we can get a better answer to that question in the course of these conferences here. But the fact is, when a military uh, mission is being is being set up, you, you might get. You might get the, uh, the, the, the flyers in a military combat mission summoned at 2 or 3 in the morning for a uh, mission briefing, and the, everything is explained there as to exactly how, what they are to do. They get their, their plan, their tactics all arranged. They get all of the signals and so on arranged. The target has to be set in their minds. They have to know how to find it and so on. Well, the retreat is like that. The retreat is like that. Retreat is like that. Getting together a mission. Uh, getting together a, a military mission for men 
It is a matter of a military mission as to what to do and how to actually strike not on earth but on the level of the soul and on the level of, well, actually just strike hell. We want to actually get a kind of spiritual military strike set against the powers of hell in the world today. That's a tall order. That takes a lot of courage, takes a lot of dedication to confront those powers. But that is what the retreat is for. It's a matter of confronting those evil powers that would threaten not only to destroy a small group of people, a large group of people, an entire village, an entire community, an entire nation, whether it's a matter of a single bullet taking a single life or an atomic bomb or a hydrogen bomb, wiping out an entire city, that is nothing in comparison with the loss of a single soul going to hell. And that is the battle that we have to wage here. That's what gives meaning to what the members of our armed services are doing elsewhere. We have to care for our own here, beginning in our faith, our loved ones, because those are the ones God has put in our care, because those are the ones God has put in our care. So we have to have figured out what we're going to do to secure our own salvation and theirs, to do everything we possibly can for their salvation. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but suffer the loss of his own soul, as our Lord asked? And the answer is, well, he gains nothing by that. Well, we are here in order to um, basically respond to that, that rhetorical statement of our Lord in telling us that the salvation of our own souls is the one thing that really matters. And it is in saving our own souls that it's to give us the only, the only justifiable hope that we have of helping our loved ones to save their souls. So uh, the retreat is going to focus on a number of things. First of all, uh, one of the questions that I asked uh, had to do with the will of God. How do we know, how do we know God's will? And we start with the question of what do we mean, what do we mean by the statement God's will? What does the expression God's will mean? So that's where we're going to start tomorrow morning. And we're going to address that question from a Catholic point of view, obviously, and uh, then look at some practical applications. And uh, then we need to take a, a good look at some of the um, feast days of this time of year. We are within the octave now of Corpus Christi. We are within the octave also of the Feast of St. John the Baptist's birth. We are, with, we are going to be celebrating the Feast of the Sacred Heart of our Lord and that will have its octave. That will be starting Friday. So we need to look at that particular message there. What do we find in the Blessed Sacrament? And then going deep, more deeply into the Blessed Sacrament, we find there the Sacred Heart of our Lord actually physically present there in the Blessed Sacrament, in the body of Christ, and alive. And we find also the figure of St. John the Baptist provided for us at this time of year. So. It all fits in terms of that masculine spirituality, that robust, that virile uh, spirituality that our Lord wants of us. And uh, then we need to take a look at the Mass and see why that is the focal point of all Catholic worship. And why not only we kneel at the Mass, but there are angels also who adore the, the same God made man on our altars that we unite in adoring with the angels and the saints in heaven here on earth. Why is that so? Why is the Mass the way it is? And uh, then we want to take a look at this evil error that began in the Garden of Eden 
the era called Gnosticism and why it is going to be the great temptation for all mankind from the very first temptation in the Garden of Eden all the way to the end of the world in the Antichrist, why that is going to be the temptation, not only for all mankind, but for each of us individually. We're going to take a look at that. We're even going to take a look at some of the, um, the philosophical development of that, because as you know, the ancient pagan religion was kind of bifurcated. Um, you had the simple rustic people who did not have great educations. They were, they were plain citizens, you might say, and they believed in mythology. They believed the legends and the stories and the fables of mythology. But the well-educated and the intellectuals did not really believe those. They believed that those fables were nothing but uh, myths and allegories. They, rep they were purely figurative and representative, but they didn't really happen. The philosophers of the pagans rather developed their intellectual, rational explanation of things. And uh, so paganism also had its philosophical level, too. So it expressed itself. Paganism expressed itself in the ancient world in philosophy of the intellectuals and the mythology of the ordinary believers, so to speak. And so it is with Gnosticism as it goes through history. We see the philosophical development of it, and we see the mythological development of it, or the mystical development of it, and what they, are, what they are doing now. Where do we see them now? How do we recognize them now? How do we even recognize them in Mormonism? Why is Mormonism a, basically a contemporary um, form of Jewish, the Jewish cabal? Why is it Kabbalism? What does it owe to Gnosticism for its belief system? That's a fair question. So we'll take a look at that in one of the conferences also. And the reason for that is not to stress the negative, but to be able to see through the veil, as they say, and to see the reality that is there behind all the, all the verbiage and all the imagery of Gnosticism as it goes through history, so we recognize it for what it is. The essential things about it, we need to be able to not only know, but recognize when we see them. And why even modernism, why modernism itself is a current manifestation of Gnosticism. And then we need to return to our theme again and that has to do with the sovereignty of our Lord in his sacred heart and what that means for us practically in our practical lives, what we should do about this, what it, what it requires of us to step up and not just be satisfied with being kind of in the reserves, as it were but to, again, realize we are on the front lines and we have to act as though we realize we're on the front lines, not in the reserves. So, in any case, uh, that's my program. Father Greenwell also has a series of conferences, as you know, uh, four conferences, and he will be covering topics of his own, which fit, I think, very well with what I've just mentioned to you. But I just wanted to map that out for you so you know where we're going with this. So in any case, um, it is now uh, 15 minutes or so until we have benediction. So this would be a good time to uh, stop here and to give you a few minutes to get ready for that. So the bell will ring at uh, five minutes to nine. And uh, then we'll start benediction at nine o'clock. We'll have the the glorious mysteries prayed during the uh, before the blessed sacrament exposed on the altar and uh, we'll also add uh, certain prayers I, I wanted to mention this too and I'm sorry uh, I forgot to do so at the end of mass after mass we'll have a thanksgiving and I always want to include the prayer on page 64 
the prayer of thanksgiving to the Most Blessed Trinity. So uh, after Mass, I'll remain in the sanctuary, lead the prayer of thanksgiving to the Most Blessed Trinity. I'll ask Father Greenwell to do that also. If Father does not, I'll ask one of you again. Uh, Steve, would you mind doing that? And if you wouldn't mind leading the... Uh, when, I'm, when I'm hearing confessions, if you wouldn't mind leading the rosary too, I appreciate that. And if I'm not in confession, I'll go ahead and lead that myself. But if you wouldn't mind, if, if Father Greenwell is here and doesn't lead this prayer of thanksgiving, most blessed Trinity, I ask you to, Steve, but also then as well, because of the feast of the, the coming feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, to lead the uh, litany of our Lord, our Lord's Sacred Heart, which you'll find on page 42, followed by an act of consecration of the human race to the Sacred Heart. And we'll do that as our thanksgiving after ma each, each of the Masses here. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let's pray and be on our way.